showing my screen? Yes, looks good. Great. Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to Christian and the uh, International Heteropterist Society. It's really a pleasure to present uh, my work, our work here, especially because it's such a, a, a tailored niche. I, I don't know in which other scenario you can get so many people interested around the same topic. So uh, it's really nice. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to tell you about this tool using insect. So Gora Redubius is, uh, uh, was a genera described by Malipati. And um, previously, it only had one species. And um, I'm going to try and show data to convince you that it is in fact a tool user that's found in Australia. So um, this is work that I'm doing through a Hirschmond Slane Foundation grant with the WA Museum, but also that I started through an Endeavor Fellowship uh, in Australia, working with Mariela Herberstein. And now I'm currently working uh, with her and with Nick Tatarnik from the WA Museum. So uh, I'm happy to tell you, uh, well, it's not official yet, uh, so we can't put the name in a published format, uh, but I think it's okay for a presentation. The name uh, that we're going to propose is Gajan and Garnang, um, and that comes from um, a word in uh, Miriwung language, uh, which you see is on the right, uh, the color of like the area where this uh, language was last known to be spoken. It's a critically endangered language. Uh, only about a couple of handfuls of people speak it nowadays. And we were proposing Gajaran, which means spinifex uh, in Mirimung. But uh, after consultation uh, to the Mirima Language Center, um, we which who spoke with the elders during COVID actually, uh, they proposed Gajan and Garnan, which means literally spinifex dweller. And that really describes what this bug uh, does. Uh, we found it in this type of habitat that you see there, that uh, tropical, um, well, or subtropical savanna, whose understory is covered pretty much in spinifex grass and many of those uh, species produce a sticky resin, not all of them, but uh, some. And you can see what I do use there um, with a big blob of resin it has gathered on its foreleg. And this resin was very important or and it still is, uh, but especially uh, many years ago uh, by the first inhabitants of Australia because it was used as a hafting adhesive for fabricating tools and weapons uh, for hunting. So after securing a spearhead like that one that uh, is, was found also in the Kimberleys, just in the same habitat as this box pretty much, um, after wedging that in, they would use resin to help it uh, passed into the to the stick. Okay, so that's where you find the, the box. This is the typical habitat um, where spinifex is very abundant. And 100% of the individuals you found, find there are covered in resin. And we've seen all instars in the field and all of them are covered in, in resin. So it looks like it's a uh, uh, fixed thing, so it's part of their normal phenotype nowadays. It's not something flexible. And through these grants, uh, I was able to camp uh, very near the field at El Cuestro Station, and that's where I live on the right, where I was living uh, when we were doing the experiments. And on the left, you can see the very fancy lab setup where we film the bugs. And that's where I'll show you, where the videos I'll, I'll show you were filmed. And that's great because you don't need to worry about controlling so much uh, the ambient uh, 
different variables uh, in the lab. Uh, as long as you do it in okay conditions in the field, you should be getting like very natural behavior. And uh, I spent a lot of time searching for the bugs and trying to document their natural history, which is still an ongoing process. Uh, it's pr probably the slowest process because you need to rely on opportunistic observations. And that's just to give you like a sense of the diet they have. Um, there's many pictures with ants. Some are meat ants, uh, which are iridomyrmex. And uh, there's also an odontomacus, it looks like, like a, a ponerine ant, also a beetle. And there's also a wasp. So there's flying and non-flying prey. We still don't know if they have a preference for some. It's common to find their exuvia in the field. And um, you can see in this picture, it's not that clear, but in this one, you can see even uh, the exuvia has resin. You can see it just where it meets the, I'm not seeing my cursor, so I can't point, but uh, you can see just at the, where the tibia, uh, the femora meet the, the grass, the blade, you can see an accumulation there of resin. That's not from the grass itself. It's been oozing out of the mold. So that mold's covered with resin. And that means that when the bug uh, grows and sheds its exoskeleton, it's devoid of resin again. So it needs to reapply it. Um, and I'll show you a nice video of how they do that. That's a late instar nymph. And you can see that's an adult. They scrape the resin with their forelegs and then start building that big blob on their femora. That's the first instar nymph. They go way quicker. I don't know why. <laughs> and then they smear that big blob that they've collected uh, through all their body. And that's even uh, their, their eyes. They cover themselves completely. The only parts that they miss are probably the antenna and some parts below uh, in the abdomen. You can see how much resin uh, he collected, she collected. You can see all that gooiness being spread in onto their bodies. And I'll just show you this is a shorter video of that. Pay attention to how it scrapes, it slides its forelegs, like just at the end of the tibia. And we did some SEM on this part. And you can see, uh, in that picture, you can see the, the resin that it's being plucked out of the blade. And you see that part of the, the end of the, of the tibia is covered with those paddle-shaped seta. And those seta are not found on other legs of the assassin bugs. And um, those seta are covered in resin in the image to the right of that one. And you can see just another angle of that tibia when we remove the tarsi. And uh, you see it has some more regular style seta and also the paddle shaped seta on the back. So um, we, it, it looks like these seta are specialized because they're not fine in the other legs. They're specialized uh, for this function. And I would love to hear later on uh, what Christian thinks about those seta. If, if, if she's seen them, uh, I know they're similar, but I don't know how similar in other bugs, no. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a big question about this is, what do they use the resin for? So they, they really are committed to gathering it and fully covering their bodies. They seem to have specialized morphology for that, which should have evolved. And then all instars do it, males and females do it. So uh, it doesn't seem like there's something about sexual selection in this character. It's probably more related to natural selection. You can see the little droplets of resin in both 
uh, box in the insert in the first insert you can see kind of a mohawk uh, forming in there of little droplets of glue and it also has some big blobs accumulated in their femora so there's been long suspicion uh, about the function on, of resin helping in prey capture and a lot of anecdotic, anecdotical evidence, even some uh, experiments. Uh, Malipatil, who described the genus, um, also mentioned that it's probably related for uh, prey capture. Although it's funny because I'm pretty sure Malipatil uh, Describe resin only in Undia redubius, but not on Gora redubius. Um, and yeah, there's some there's some work that's shown uh, that resin uh, is related to prey capture. Um, and as I say, there's been like it's been a long held uh, hunch that. Uh, that resin functions in prey capture, and that's why informally, and they've been called like resin bugs or the streaky trap hypothesis. Um, this is a more recent work uh, from a new world uh, genus as well, also suggesting the same thing. But perhaps what was missing uh, was experiments uh, with different types of prey that. Um, simulate uh, natural conditions to have uh, to have more evidence in favor of this. So that's what uh, we try to do. So the hypothesis is that resin aids in prey capture. You can tell that the bug on the right uh, struggled with that ant on the ground for a while because it's all covered with uh, dirt that it got stuck to the sticky surface. So because all bugs were covered in resin, then the trouble was how to remove uh, the resin. And this, uh, my partner helped me a lot with this. Now I kind of have the hang of it, but still my pulse is a bit shaky that I'm worried to squeeze the box or, or break a leg or something, but I'm getting better at it. But the idea is to grasp the bug between two column pads and then scrape the resin off. Because this is uh, like uh, strong manipulation uh, to counterbalance the experiment. What we did was that we also performed these manipulations in the bugs that in the resin treatment. So we removed the resin and then let them apply the resin again onto themselves. And we did the opposite with the other ones. We let them apply the resin and then we removed it. And then each bug to control for individual um, hunting ability, uh, which I'm glad we did because there were some bugs that were really amazing and how they moved. I don't know if it was practice or what, but they were very good at capturing prey. Others, not so much. So. I'm glad we did this design in which each bug experimented a fly and an ant and in both conditions while being equipped with or deprived of resin. So that's pretty much how the are arenas looked. Uh, it's big enough that the bug really needs to pursue the, the prey. And I forgot to mention an important aspect, and it's that this uh, species is Micropterus or Apterus. Its, its wings are really reduced, that they're not functional or almost non-existent. So we chose flies to simulate difficult to capture prey. They fly, they're strong, um, they're big, and ants to simulate smaller prey that may need like more precise grasping movements. Uh, they're too small that they actually can be difficult to catch. And then uh, each bug experienced one and then the other one on the next day. We only tested them once per day. And then the same on another day without resin or with resin. 
So uh, now to the exciting bit. This bug doesn't have resin. And the anti-scape. This one doesn't have resin. And the fly escaped. This one has resin, and the fly is particularly jumpy. That was one out of one with a very difficult prey. So uh, we did mixed effect uh, model analysis, and the first analysis was whether the bug captured or not the prey item within the allotted time, allotted time, which was one hour. And this, we only consider hunts in which the assassin bug had at least 10 opportunities to capture the prey item. That means it went by, uh, close by the assassin bug. So the probability of capture within an hour really decreases. Uh, there's a strong effect size when the bug is not equipped with resin. So that's a predicted probability of capture in one hour. Then uh, considering only the hunts in which the assassin bug was successful at capturing the prey item, uh, we compared the number of capture attempts that were necessary. And uh, as you can see, for both uh, ants and flies, bugs needed like double, a bit more than double the number of attacks to actually capture its prey. So it took them more effort to capture them. And if we do an analysis with the same data, but instead of uh, choosing the, the independent variable as the probability of capture within the allotted time, instead of that, we did the probability of capture for each single attack. Because in a single interaction, the bug could either capture the prey with one single attack, like the fly you saw, or uh, require many different attempts. And this is probably more realistic of what happens in nature, because um, I really doubt that the bug has more than twice, two attacks in a row, because the prey just uh, walks away, runs away, or fly away. And in here, you can see again that capturing flies is more difficult than capturing ants. But also that uh, resin does have a, uh, it increases by 20% uh, probability of capturing the prey item, which sounds uh, like a strong effect if you're depending on one single attack. If they tell you, okay, uh, you increase your probability by 20%, okay, sounds like a good, uh, good odds. And then I'm going to show you something that uh, starts getting into the minute details of how this may function. So this is slowed down, and you can pay attention to the box movements. So even after grasping and touching the prey, they escape, especially with this one, it's notorious that it takes it quite some while and it escapes. So it doesn't seem like they're super good graspers <laughs> of prey. So we did another analysis and this is only considering instances in which the fly, we didn't do it with ants because the video resolution was not I wasn't feeling as confident for telling when the bug grasped an ant uh, as I was confident when telling that the bug grasped a fly. So we did it only with flies. And this is the escape probability of the fly. So this is from the fly's perspective now. So the fly is more, way more likely to escape. And this is after being touched. So the assassin bug already made contact with its prey and then the effect of resin really seems to stand out. And this is uh, what we recently reported in, in this paper, Mariela and I. I'll just leave it there in case someone wants to take a screenshot and search for it. 
And thinking about that last video and about the exact mechanism. So stickiness is the first thing that comes to mind, right? But uh, prey seldomly or never got completely stuck to the bug. The bug still needs to react. And I'll show you a, a video in where, and this is one of the very, of the seldom opportunities in which the prey actually kind of contacted the bug by mistake and got a bit stuck. You see it landed on the femora. I, I'll replay it again. It's, it lands on the hind leg. And the bug still hasn't grasped it. It's until now that it switches it and it passes it over to its front legs and then manages to stab it. And then he relaxes it because he knows he's got it. <laughs> but before then it was struggling a lot because he still wasn't, didn't have a secure grip. So adhesion could help in that sense. And in the sense that we saw where uh, flies were way more likely to escape after being grasped by the assassin box if the bug didn't have resin. But it may also help them, and that's a, a, a new hypothesis I, I would like to bring forward, which is that it, it may also help them with their proprioception. So the sense of how their body is in relation to uh, the prey item in this case. And with this video, it should be a bit clearer. So you could see that the fly was kind of jumpy and he touched it with different legs. So if the resin is such that it provides momentary adhesion and maybe it does help like tailor down the precise movements that the bugs need to do. And this, if it's a fraction of seconds that it, um, accelerates the decision of the bug, then it may be uh, very important. So that's something that we don't know. And it's actually not a mutually exclusive hypothesis. It, it could be a combined effect of stickiness and enhanced proprioception. So about tulius, so it's something that we generally hear more with vertebrates. And um, Here's one definition. There's many that have been put forward, but uh, I like this one that says that it's the acquisition of items that are deployed later. So in this case, uh, and it needs to be an external item, right? It's an acquisition. It doesn't count if you're producing the, the resin, like it happens in, in other bugs, like Christian has shown. So uh, if you're not producing the resin, but you need to gather it from the environment and then use it later for hunting, this could be hours later, days later, then it uh, is categorized as tool use. In case uh, someone's wondering about the octopus and is not familiar with, the, with that case, it's a very nice case in which they show that the octopus travel around with uh, two halves of a coconut and then get inside the coconut <laughs> when they feel threatened. Okay, so Tulio seems to have two different origins and that we should treat them differently in vertebrates and invertebrates. There may be a mixed gray line, but uh, for um, easiness, uh, it's good to point out their differences. So in vertebrates, it's usually more related to cognitive abilities, and in invertebrates, more related to innate behavior. So it's still tool use, it's just been polished by evolution, whereas in the other one, what's been polished by evolution is the mental capacity to achieve some uh, flexible behavior. So uh, the Prevailing hypothesis for the evolution of tulius in insects is that of uh, behavioral transfer, context transfer, uh, put forward by Alcock with the antlions. And if you've seen an antlion, they make these pits and they dig them by throwing flicking sand with their heads. 
So what Alco pro proposed was that the behavior was already there. The only change was to throw sand at ants that were walking by in the pit, and that's what they do. So you can imagine an easy change uh, by just changing the context of expression of that behavior. So the behavior was there. Um, so it should be like more easy to imagine from a mutational basis. For these bugs, it is not that clear because you saw the complexity of the behaviors by which they scrape the resin. They also have morphology that uh, looks specialized for that purpose. And it doesn't seem to be used uh, in other contexts. My observations in other contexts of these bugs has been limited, but I have seen them like mating, uh, walking, resting, hunting, climbing up plants. And none of these behaviors seem to be like used in other contexts besides tool use. So it's hard to think about how this evolved uh, if it's not a simple context transfer and the behavioral precursors could be that they are lost now and that's why we are not seeing it or that they've been substantially modified. So, um, which is possible because um, from recent work, it looks uh, uh, spearheaded uh, by Christian. It looks like uh, the evolution of Tullius is pretty old. <laughs> so it looks like it's been polished for quite a while. Uh, it's still possible that resin serves other functions, and these are the eggs um, of these bugs, and they are coded in resin. And um, there's been a few attempts to uh, document an, um, a benefit for this resin. It's been mentioned that, for example, it could prevent dehydration of the eggs or also uh, prevent uh, predators from getting the eggs. So the eggs are covered in resin in this species. So um, it looks like resin could serve several functions, actually. Who knows if they serve an, an anti-predator function also in adults and in eggs, yeah, it needs to be tested, which is something that uh, we are currently doing. So um, in this uh, paper from uh, Christian's lab, uh, They've shown that uh, the use of exogenous resin, so tool use, basically collecting resin and using it later, has evolved at least uh, twice. And most familiar cases are in the Apiumerines, which are a New World tribe. Um, and Godarebulus, I think, would be somewhere around there. I'm not sure. Uh, so. We don't know if this represents still another uh, convergent evolution of tool use, or if it represents the same event from the old world. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do with that. And there's species in Asia as well that needs to be explored a bit more. Uh, but it, it looks like for some reason, um, the evolution of tool use in this group of insects was particularly common, and it's way more common than, than other insects. Uh, I just wanted to pinpoint uh, to some behaviors that I found interesting com comparing uh, with this apiomerai. Uh, and this is uh, work from Avila Nunes uh, in the Andes. And you can see that some behaviors are shared, like they scrape the resin with their forelegs. Uh, they don't have the structures though, the paddle-shaped seda, they have other seda. And they also smear it on the mid legs. So it's funny because yet different, they share morphologically, they share some behavioral similarities. And they later transfer it to the hind legs as well. Uh, some behavioral similarities, here's my cat. Um, also are shared with other resin uh, related behaviors, uh, like when the um, apiomerines transfer resin to cover the eggs. 
And this is work from Dimitri Ferrero in Christian's uh, lab. So feature directions, uh, I would like to describe the behavior in more detail to compare it with the behavior of other species. And if there's people here working with uh, resin box uh, in the new world, uh, I suggest that we, we start everyone doing the same of describing the behavior to search for similarities. I think that would be uh, very interesting. Um, and I know some, some of you are uh, doing apiomerus. Uh, also, something funny is that Godarreubius westralensis, the one described by Mal Malipatil, appears to also use resin, and I would like to explore that more. And maybe this other genus, Poesilus fossilis. And I would um, also like to compare it with apiomerus from here in Costa Rica, but uh, I've been having more trouble finding them. They seem to be a bit uh, stational. And that's it. Uh, I would like to thank the founders, people that helped me in the field, in particular my partner, Iria, and then uh, all of you for listening and uh, IHS for organizing the talk. And if you have questions, of course. <laughs> Thank you. So a big round of applause first, you know, in any way you can give us applause.